Ireland used to talk, and I'm still there. So if you have any questions, raise your hand, and I will um, extend. We'll start with you because you're so much closer. Is that okay? <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm from Iran, but from the northwestern part of the country, so my descent comes from Turkish, that's why I'm interested in here too. Uh, this question is for any of you who would be kind to answer. Uh, you said that in the Sarai or in the Ottoman Empire, there was the Turkish language and the Arabic language and the Persian Farsi language. So I can relate that because of the religion, the Arabic language was spoken and the Turkish was the daily life. But why Persian? Why the Persian language was spoken there and by whom? Thank you. Okay. Uh, this is a very good question. Yes, why well, Persian? In fact, uh, this goes back from Ottomans, like in the Anatolia, in Anatolia, and Turkish becoming a literary language there in 13th, 14th centuries. Like uh, under the Seljuk uh, Empire, which was a Turkic Empire, Turks employed Persian scribes <coughs> from previous uh, generations of Muslim empires, and uh, many Arabic loan words in Turkish transmitted to the language uh, through Persian. For example, we have Persian forms of Arabic languages. For example, so Persian had a very important influence on. Western Turkish, especially, which is the, the basis for the Ottoman Turkish. And also, there is cultural, mystical Islam, and uh, cultural uh, influence is there as well. But, uh, you know, uh, Persian and Arabic, especially in the belt from the um, South India through Iran into Balkans. Persian has been a very determining language on all communities who live there, all Muslim communities, Turkic, Iranian, of course, or even Arabic. Uh, so uh, this may answer your question. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Hello, my question for, uh, for Dr. Kuratu. Uh, the book you showed, uh, Eshka Mamnun, I'm from Iran, to Eshka Mamnun, The Forbidden Love, there was a date on the mid-1341, and um, was it the date? And Because Atatürk changed also the date in your country, along with the handwriting, yeah. as far as I know. And I, my question is, is it the moon year, or no, is it the solar year? But was it the date 1341? No, no, the date, uh, that was another edition that uh, the author had already uh, updated, let me put it this way. Uh, the first edition of this update was 1939. This is a Gregorian calendar, just like the one we use here. So it's not the moon calendar. That changed through the reforms after the Turkish Republic was established. But then those dates were already in use under the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire used up to three calendars uh, towards the end of it, because it was a part of the global trade networks. They needed to, but that had to kind of cancel the moon-based uh, hijrah, uh, like uh, the calendar, moon-based calendar. Uh, I have two questions uh, uh, from Arlen, if you don't mind. The first question is about, uh, with all the effort of Atatürk, uh, Turkey was not accepted to European Union. <laughs> How does the uh, Ottoman Emperor legacy mm. has that effect? And that's one question. Yeah. The second question uh, is about the current affair. Right now, we see a big sectarian war in the last 15 years between Shia and Sunni. And uh, three camps in the Middle East, which is Iran, Saudi, and Turkey. Uh, two camps from Sunni side and Iran on the other side. How does the legacy of Safavi, Safavi dynasty, oh, right. and, and the, uh, which they act like a puppet of the West, uh, has the influence on the existing current affair of the 
the same sectarian war which changed the discourse of Middle East from concentrating on Palestinian issue into sectarian war. Sure. Thank you. So could you, could you just clarify for me, sorry, how did the Safavids fit into, into your question? Uh, as you recall, the Safavid dynasty was fed always by Catholic Church and Western country whenever they want to stop Ottoman Empire. Yeah. That sectarian war has been raised in the last 15 years right. uh, in Middle East, and the discourse of nationalist Arab and the Palestinian issue has been changed to a sectarian war between Sunni and Shia, and with recent effect, even the Sunni now is divided between Qatar, Turkey, one side, and Saudi Arabia. How does that legacy yeah, yeah. of the history now affect the current affair? Sure, excellent. Uh, those are both really excellent questions. I will do my best um, to speak to them. And so, I mean, the first one I think is really interesting. Uh, I think about that a lot. I mean, how does the sense that looking at, uh, at, at Turkey, uh, on the part of external uh, persons that they, they see something oriental, something Ottoman, something that evokes um, the, you know, the great Turkish threat, as it was called, the expansion of the Ottoman Empire, uh, the, the, the Sultan's armies um, through, throughout Europe, towards Austria, towards France. The, the, the notion that, that, to some extent, there is, there is a certain orientalism. There is a, uh, a lens that, that, that um, persons outside Turkey continue to use when they look at it, and, and especially at the, the, uh, the possibility of it entering the Euro European community in, in the way that you describe. So, um, I mean, I think to some extent that those associations are there, um, but it's really hard to say, I mean, what sort of role they actually play in policy. I remember a few years back, um, you know, yeah, not many years ago, when, when at least from an external perspective, the face of uh, domestic Turkish politics looked different than they do now uh, when, when this sort of EU question was, was more at, at the forefront, at least of, of news uh, culture, uh, that this, this conversation about, uh, oh, in fact, it is a uh, prejudice association uh, between the, the, the president and prime minister and, and the sultan, uh, you know, someone who's so backward that, that you know, he, he, himself and his country could not possibly be part of the EU, that the notion that this uh, has some role to play in these geopolitical, uh, uh, these complicated geopolitical actions. And I think for the most part there are other factors that have a lot more to do with the politics surrounding Turkey's place or lack of place. Uh, in the EU. I mean, I think of the conversation uh, about civil rights, about uh, the role of the military in society. I think these other issues that pertain more to how outsiders view the actual structure of Turkish civil society. Uh, and, you know, you can always, uh, you should always take an external perspective with a grain of salt, but I think there's, there's you know, often some truth to them. But I think these, these issues uh, probably are more at the forefront of that conversation. Um, the second point I think is really interesting because, I mean, to me it's very much um, related to what we're talking about now, the sense that in contemporary um, civic, civil, sectarian uh, problems, that for some reason consistently we're looking back at the way that these empires interacted. But almost all the time we do that in a very ahistorical way. And that includes historians. If, if, if you look, if you browse through the work that historians do very often, unfortunately, we're very colored by the world we see around us. And when we look at the past, we choose at times, unfortunately, to see it very much like now. So, I mean, you bringing up the stuff of an Ottoman sort of disputation um, as, as something that's reminiscent of, of contemporary sectarian conflict, I think, is instructive in this sense. I, I can say flat out that there is no direct link between those two things. The realities of um, uh, intra-confessional, intra-confessional intra relationships in the Middle East are the product, for the most part, of much more recent um, structural imperialist, colonialist events in that region. And I think that the, the connection to like a Shia Safavid empire and a Sunni Ottoman uh, empire that, that clashed in, in years gone by, I think that for the most part that is a very tenuous link. But that doesn't mean that people aren't evoking it. And it acts as a lot of power when people are saying, yes, this is just like this, this bygone imperial struggle. But I mean, for the most part, when we look at Ottoman Safavid interaction, the times in which um, either of those governments actually crack down on their, uh, you know, Ottomans cracking down on Shia or, or vice versa. That really came for the most part, when we're not talking about a cosmopolitan paradise, but it came for the most part in periods of, of strife, uh, of, of, of challenge to, to the status quo. Um, so um, 
I guess in some, like I don't see really a, a connection as a historian, but as somebody who's looking at, at, at the power of contemporary evocations of the past, that that is a very important issue. I wanted to quickly sort of follow on what, what Alan said earlier on, on the, the, the debate about to what extent um, Turkey qualified, quote unquote, for membership in the European Union. And um, against um, very, very loud and audible uh, commentary that emphasized that culturally and historically, uh, Turkey, because of its Ottoman past, was not European. There were others who just as eloquently pointed out that for uh, the greater part of Ottoman history, the core of the empire, that's where most of its people lived, where its, most of its elite would be seats were from, and that most were, um, where its taxes were collected, uh, was actually um, southeastern and eastern Europe. Uh, and um, increasingly, among political commentators um, outside and inside academia, the Europeanness of the Ottoman Empire was, uh, was emphasized, and often, uh, the same commentators went one step further. They uh, reminded their readers that uh, it was first and foremost um, Ottoman Muslims from the Balkans who created the Republic of Turkey. Uh, and, and so there is this other strand as well that in this particular way tried to emphasize enduring uh, Europeanness of the Ottomans and by extension the Republic. Uh, and um, a, a very, very large uh, sort of a multiplicity of connections. Well, uh, I have a question about how technology might influence the. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I wonder. If you have any thoughts on how technology might have influenced the fate of the Ottoman Empire, because uh, the gasoline engine and gasoline-derived power is invented, and all of a sudden in the world there's an empire that sits on top of a large portion of the resources. And, you know, in addition to the ethnic and religious diversities and all these other social issues, I wonder if that could have been a catalyst for a lot of the changes. Well, I would, um, I would say that uh, as much as oil resources um, in, in Ottoman Iraq, um, and those ones that were, I mean, in, in Arabia, they were discovered much later, but it was all about the uh, sort of three Iraqi provinces of the Ottoman Empire, um, that the world and the, and the British, um, who were most interested in them, knew about. Uh, why they were important? Um, I think uh, we should be careful of uh, attributing the empire's end and its breakup too much to that, because uh, I think more important was the decision of the Ottoman leadership to take uh, the empire into the war in the first place. And then sometimes um, my students ask me, so what would have happened if the Ottomans had stayed neutral if they hadn't uh, entered the war? And of course, we can't answer this question, but um, we have a we can make educated guesses on the basis, for example, of Iran in World War I. Iran was not, it didn't enter the war, it was mar very marginally involved. It was occupied because of its oil resources by the Russians and by the British, but it survived as a territorial entity. And uh, even though uh, it's impossible for us to know what would have happened if, uh, at least, um, you know, there is one possibility about how the Ottoman Empire could have uh, come out of the war um, more intact uh, than it did. So oil is important, but I think more was important was the decision of the Ottoman leadership to join the central powers, Austria-Hungary and the Germans. Well, first, I am Hüleyr Aylar. I have been in Canada for uh, 16 years. I'm Turkish-Canadian. was born in 1965. Um, and uh, first of all, I'm so grateful for uh, Turkish Canadian Society, Vancouver Turkish Film Festival, and the uh, for bringing this meaningful event to the public. My question about uh, Turkish flag. So, uh, Mr. Cruz, uh, Dr. Cruz's presentation, we saw uh, the, the, the scene about Abdul Hamid. And then behind, there was the Ottoman flag, like the, the green uh, color with three crescents. And then 
that the right side we saw a Turkish flag that we are using right now. So I, my question is, there are lots of confusion, even in my mind. When does um, the Turkish flag that we are using uh, established? Uh, do you know? I don't, uh, I can't come up with the exact date, but I mean, uh, today's Turkish flag, of course, draws on one of the flags that was employed by the Ottomans, and Abdul Hamid era especially is a high time for uh, Ottoman iconography, and they developed more symbolism about certain flags, uh, seals, uh, banners, etc. But it has been a part of like all pre-modern empires to use various banners. So, uh, as far as I know, modern Turkish flag, flag uh, which was established and certain measurements, uh, there is a law about how, what is the red, what is the, where is the crescent, where is the star now, these were all set in churches, if I'm not uh, wrong, but it draws on to one of the banners or flags that was employed by Ottomans. So it is a, there is a continuity in the flag. But I can't come up with the exact answer for that. You can always go to online, there is an Islam Ansiklovetisi, <laughs> and they have a very wonderfully detailed uh, article on the Bayrak, or Turk Bayrak. Uh, yeah, it will be very informative. I should go and check it. Thank you for the question. <laughs> I think I know the question, answer the question. I think it was around 1870s, the flag of Ottoman Empire, the <coughs> Turkish flag. Yeah. 1870s. Around, is I think. Uh, about the Ottoman flag. And after, there were many different, like a green flag, a red flag, and you know they were used uh, together yeah. and different purposes, unlike the Republican version. I and that, there is also one saying that after the finding of the Turkish Republic. Even Atatürk at one point wasn't really happy with the flag, that he wanted to change, he wanted to go to like post kind of flag, but that's just the same. Thank you. No problem. It is also, uh, I think it's also useful to, um, in, in, um, in addition to what um, what Professor Kuro said, uh, to, um, uh, to mention that uh, in, the, in the late Ottoman period, I mean, uh, starting roughly from the 1830s to the end of empire, like, for example, official publications for on buildings, etc. What you had, either in addition or instead of um, what we now know as the, uh, the the flag of the Republic of Turkey, you had an imperial coat of arms, which was very elaborate, which uh, the Quran, which um, uh, symbols of sultanic power, of justice, and and uh, military capacity. And it's a little bit like the dualism in, uh, in the case of Canada or in the case of the United Kingdom of the uh, royal standard uh, on one side and the national flag on the other. And uh, so this is something that if you um, open illustrated uh, magazines from the Ottoman Empire or official publications, you will very often come across this particular symbol of empire as well. for all the panelists. And again, thanks for the Turkish Canadian Society, Vancouver Film Festival, uh, and SFU for this organization. Um, I just want to um, underline, we are talking about an empire here. We are discussing the past history of the human beings which includes not just Ottoman Empire, but many of them. Please, I, I invite all of us to remember that context. Uh, history is, of course, something so valuable. We all need to go back to it and cherish it and learn from it. But also, we have to look forward as humanity, as people, right now struggling for keeping our 
earth in, in impact for, for the future generations. So, um, what I realized through the talks today, both, not both, three of the talks, um, I felt like we are discussing this issue as if there is a big admin, admin, admiration, like in missing the past, and you know, rather than looking forward. And this is actually how I see what's happening in the modern Turkey today, unfortunately. It's not being what we call, I think, neo Ottomanism or something. It's sort of uh, in in um, in exchange of uh, the modern Turkish movement. It's sort of now taking place and um, pressuring or pushing people to go back in a way. So when we are, of course, realizing the past. We shouldn't be actually be taken away from our forward move as human beings. So one quick thing about uh, um, I, I would like to just um, specifically focus on uh, a few words from um, Dr. Crew. Crew uh, Salem was uh, mentioning when he th this one is really short. When you were uh, referring to that uh, childhood history with your friend Suleiman, uh, you used uh, uh, something about how they saw uh, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk as Vatan Haini, and you translated it as atheist, which was not, I guess, true. Oh, and this was, I was just. But what doesn't mean no, no. atheism. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. Totally different, yeah. Uh, you're right. You're totally right. Thank you for pointing this out. In fact, atheist is one of the words. He was an atheist, but an Aini, etc. But I didn't. I was giving the uh, translation, like the Turkish form, as I was reading my English text. So, okay. Yeah. Just to, just to clarify yeah. that. Yeah. Um, the other thing I realized during your talk was uh, when you mentioned um, the early uh, modern Turkey times, uh, after the modern republic was uh, built, uh, until 1960s, until 1960s and 70s, you uh, said that, um, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, just correct me if so, uh, I, what I understood, you were referring to like that early period was it was a period um, the multi ethnicities Sorry, we have to wrap it up because we have to start the next movie. The okay. next film. I'm so okay. sorry okay. about that. Okay, that's fine. I'll keep it short. So what I'm trying to say, as much as the Ottoman Empire was a multicultural, multi-ethnic entity, similar to also the modern Canada we are living in now, the modern Turkish Republic was also multi-ethnic. And there were like more than 20 ethnic groups living together, and none of them, they were all able to talk their own mother language. Like, similar to Canada, there was one formal language which was used in government words, and it was Turkish, chosen as Turkish, but they were never oppressed or they were not um, taken as a melting pot which is happening in the US. So okay. just to keep it clear. You know, just to <laughs> clarify, for example, we know the suppression of uh, ethnic minorities, languages throughout the Turkish history, and it may be state-based, it may be by the missionaries of the state. There was the Tandash campaign and attacks on Jewish minorities in Edirne, in Istanbul during 40s. All of us know about uh, not allowing people to use particular languages, uh, words from particular languages to be given uh, as child names. But I'm not saying that people couldn't speak their languages or people were totally like shut into houses or something, but 
there was a very big suppression and oppression over any other language than Turkish. This was a homogenizing act and it was not happening only in Turkey, in many countries in the world. But as historians, we need to you know, articulate these as facts and uh, they were periodical facts. We can continue this discussion after this event, but uh, historical knowledge at least does not agree with what you're saying, and in Canada's history as well, it, is not, it hasn't been a golden years. There were suppression of, you know, local languages, native populations. These were happening throughout 19th and 20th centuries. This was the making of a new world under the boundaries of nation states, which are now experiencing major challenges. It is not again a Turkish story. Turkey is just what we are focusing on now and through the remembrance of Ottoman Empire. I want to also stress the fact that I don't necessarily admire Turkey or Ottoman Empire. I try to understand it. I love Turkish novelists as much as Ottoman poets because as you read someone with curiosity, it's impossible not to like a cultural product of any human being. Uh, but uh, I think uh, uh, what you said about like in uh, early Republican period, uh, there were reasons. Uh, those reasons you can agree today or not. But there was some uh, ideology about being a Turk. Uh, Atatürk, one of his most famous words is ne mutlu Türk'üm diyene. He didn't say like your it church. Was a neo, yeah, uh, yeah, no, no. nationalist way of being Turk. Yes, it was yes. actually agree on that. combining the multi-ethnic <laughs> identity. Which, is, which of may be also people. called homogenization. Thank you very much. Thank you.